can kind of look around tonight and you wonder what happened. Well, in case you guys don't know, in case you're under a rock somewhere, Adam DiGiacomo is getting married this very evening. So, all the DiGiacomos have left the building. <laughs> that'll do it. And it's, yeah, and that'll do it. Exactly. So we get an intimate evening together, and I can't wait. Because God has really been working on me for the last month and a half or so to bring this message to you. And I'm, I'm really hoping it has the impact that it has had on me. Because it's been spectacular. And this is not me. I'm hoping he has a work in you that is spectacular. So, with that, can, can we all bow our heads and pray to start tonight? Father, we don't know what's in store for us. Seems like one minute to the next. But you do. You've gathered us here tonight as this, this body of believers. Father, we didn't come just to sit here and be friends with each other, although that's pretty awesome. We really want to hear from you tonight. We really welcome your presence into this building, this time, this space. Lord, whatever is here, would you use it to speak to us, to change our lives, to help us to know you better, and bring us, bring us just to obedience and love to our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, guys, we're going to be talking about, well, I'm going to be preaching out of the book of Esther. And if you know the book of Esther, she's a queen. So my first question is, what comes to your mind when I say queen? I mean, what's, what are the attributes of a queen? What's it like to be queen? And feel free to just shout out whatever. You get what you want, okay? What else? What's it like to be queen? Queen for a day, if you had to be queen. Spoiled? Power. Power. Oh. Respect. Respect. <laughs> Jewelry. Stuff. I get stuff. Yes, queen is good then, right? Queen's awesome. This is the idea that we have queen. You're... I was talking to Wendy about this. She says, royal, you're special, you're significant, aren't you? And you live a life, what, of luxury. Yeah, it's comfortable. I want for nothing. And you got control, don't you? You tell somebody, hey, I want some Twinkies and a glass of milk. And what? Somebody's off to go get it, right? Because you're the queen. This is the idea that we have. And this is... This comes from our culture, and it comes from what we know. But the story of Esther is a little different. Yes, she's a queen, but it's not quite that image that she lives with. So we're going to explore that a little bit. And the first place I want to go is to know what it's like to be a queen, to be Queen Esther, is you've got to know what the king's like, right? Who's the guy that's king? Because that's, that's a big deal. David. David is a king. He's not Esther's king. Esther's king is named Xerxes. Now, this guy is something else. Have anybody guys seen the movie 300? You know that, right? 300 Greeks go against the Persian army, right? Whose army is that? Xerxes army. Yeah. And that movie's like totally weird and stuff in places, but it's based on a true story, right? This guy really existed and these 300 Spartans stood against his army and this army, to give you an idea of his power, there's a line in the movie where it says that his army that has enough archers that when they loose their arrows that it blots out the sun. And the Spartans say, that's fine, we'll fight in the shade. 
because they're even better than the Persians. But these guys are incredible. This guy has about, estimates say, about 1,700,000 soldiers at his command. There's nothing that stands in the way of 1,700,000 soldiers. They march on where they march, they go where they want to go, and they do whatever they want. And this guy tells them which direction to go. This is the king. They actually didn't, they call him king in the book, in the Bible, in Esther, but quite often he was referred to as an emperor because he had vast territory. And even the name in, in Persian, the name that he goes by, goes a little further than that. The name translated actually translates literally king of kings. Again, the idea of who this guy is, powerful, strong, nothing he can't do, says what he wants to say, goes where he wants to go, does what he wants to do. This is the king. And in our story, in Esther, I'm going to start off with a little bit of background. So we're going to go to Esther chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, to, to let us know where we're at and what's going on. Reading that, it says that these events happened in the days of King Xerxes, who reigned over 127 provinces, stretching from India to Ethiopia. At that time, Xerxes ruled his empire from his royal throne at the fortress of Susa. In the third year of his reign, he gave a banquet for all his nobles and officials. He invited all the military officers of Persia and Medea, as well as the princes and nobles of the provinces. The celebration lasted 180 days, a tremendous display of the opulent wealth of his empire and the pomp and splendor splendor of his majesty. There is no more powerful person on the planet than this guy. Who throws a party for six months? How many kegs do you have to have? Uh, Snoop Dogg, maybe. Yeah, maybe Snoop Dogg? Uh, I don't even think he's that bad. Caesar. Maybe Caesar did. 180 days these guys are partying. What does it say there? 127 provinces from Ethiopia. So think about it. Right there by Egypt, a little bit south of Egypt in Africa, all the way to India. This guy rules it all. 127 provinces. He rules nations. Nations. These are 127 nations. These are totally different people group. This guy has power over millions. And he commands this army of 1,700,000. He has opulence. He has authority. And this is the world of Esther. This is the world she lives in. Continuing on in our story a little bit, we're going to jump down to verse 10 and 12 in chapter 1. And it says that on the seventh day of the feast, when King Xerxes was in high spirits because of wine. In other words, he's smashed, right? He told the, the seven eunuchs who attended him, okay, so he's got these seven eunuchs that attend him. I'm not going to try to pronounce their names. But he says to bring Queen Vashti to him with a royal crown on her head. And he wanted the nobles and all the other men to gaze on her beauty, for she was a very beautiful woman. But when they conveyed the king's order to the queen Vashti, she refused to come, and this made the king furious, and he burned with anger. Who did she just take off? The king, the emperor, the king of kings. This guy, you don't say no. He says, do it, you do it. She said no. But he's drunk on his but smashed. Some, some scholars think that verse 11, when he says to bring the queen Vashti to him with the royal crown on, what he meant was only that. Just wearing a crown. 
Okay. You want to... Okay, this guy is, is drunk. He's telling the queen to come in. I'm going to show you off to my buddies. Check this out. I'm the king. And she spits in his face. Oh my goodness. This guy's hot. This guy is mad. Mad as a hornet. So what's he going to do? He asks his advisors. He says, hey, what do I do with this queen now? She just spit in my face. They answer him and they say, uh, Queen Vashti has wronged, this is in verse 16 through 20, by the way. Queen Vashti has wronged not only the king, but also every noble and citizen throughout the empire. Women everywhere will begin to despise their husbands when they learn that Queen Vashti has refused to appear before the king. Before this day is out, the wives of all the king's nobles throughout Persia and Medea will hear what the queen did and start treating their husbands the same way. There'll be no end to the contempt and anger. So if it please the king, we suggest you issue a written decree, a law of the Persians and Medes that cannot be revoked. It should order that Queen Vashti be forever banished from the presence of King Xerxes and that the king should choose another queen more worthy than she. When this decree is published throughout the king's vast empire, husbands everywhere, whatever their rank, will receive proper respect from their wives. Ladies, you got control of your woman? He didn't have control of his woman. It ain't happening. Can you see the attitude, the arrogance? All husbands will have the proper respect of their wives then. You don't get away with this. Right? Guys are going, sure, right, honey? And she's going, don't even think about it. Ain't happening. Not happening. But that's, that's who they were. That's the way their society worked. This is how they looked at women. This sounds more like property, doesn't it? Than it does a wife. Husbands and wives. It sounds like, I own you. Don't you forget it. And they didn't want anybody to forget it. They didn't want these women to forget that. So Xerxes, what am I going to do now? All right, yeah, edict, fine. But I want a new queen. He's the king, okay. Jump into chapter 2, verses 8 through 14. As a result of the king's decree, Esther, along with many other young women, were brought to the king's harem at the fortress of Susa and placed in Haggai's care. Haggai was very impressed with Esther and treated her kindly. He quickly ordered a special menu for her and provided her with beauty treatments. He also assigned her seven maids specifically chosen from the king's palace, and he moved her and the maids into the best place in the harem. I'm going to stop there. Wait a second. He's choosing a queen. What? He's got a harem? Wait, I thought king, queen. This was... Oh, wait a minute. This is not that way then, is it? It's not one man, one woman. And especially for this guy. You rule that many people, you do what you want, right? He's got a bunch of women. He's got a harem. And these guys, what does it say? As a result of the king's decree, many other women were brought to the king's harem. I don't think they did a, hey, would you like to be queen contest? They just went and got them. That wasn't a choice. They took these young ladies and they put them in this harem. Let's continue reading. This, this queen business isn't sounding like our queen at all. So, verse 10, Esther had not told them, anyone, of her nationality or family background because Mordecai had to direct her not to do so. Now, we hear about Mordecai for the first time. Who's this guy? It's Esther's cousin. He's much older than her. He's an old man. 
but he took her in because, well, her mother and father are dead. And he's been taking care of her. She's family. This is what you do. So Mordecai's been taking care of her, and he tells her not to tell anybody. Keep this on the, the down low. Don't tell him. So Mordecai had directed her not to do so, to tell everybody. And he said, every day Mordecai would take a walk near the courtyard of the harem to find out about Esther and what was happening to her. Once again, wait a second. This is another clue. She didn't go just because she wanted to go. They took her. And he's not even allowed to go see her. But she's family, so he goes every day and walks the courtyard. He walks the fence. Hey, have you heard of Esther? What's going on with her? What's going on with my cousin? Is there any news? He's going to ask. He's going to ask whoever he can ask, right? Why? Because he can't just walk in there and see her. She's in the king's harem. You don't just get to go in there. That ain't happening. But this is the world. And we're talking about that she lives in. Mordecai goes to see her every day. And before each woman, continuing on in verse 12, was taken to the king's bed, she was given the prescribed 12 months of beauty treatments, six months with oil of myrrh, followed by six months with special perfumes and ointments. When it was time for her to go to the king's palace, she was given her choice of whatever clothing or jewelry she wanted to take from the harem. That evening, she was taken to the king's private rooms, and the next morning, she was brought to the second harem. Second harem? Where the king's wives live. Wait, what? Wait, we got the one harem. Now we got a second harem where his wives live, multiple. We haven't even got to the queen yet. This is weird, right? This is not this is not America we're talking about. <laughs> to the second hand where the where the king's wives lived, and she would be under the care of Shazgas, the king's eunuch in charge of the concubines. She would never go to the king again unless she had especially he had especially enjoyed her and requested her by name. Wow, remember that part. You don't get to see the king unless he calls your name. It's all for him. All for him. Are you getting the picture of what it was like for Esther? This queen business. It's not like we thought. She's not commanding a bunch of servants waiting on her hand and foot. Yeah, she's got some cool things going on. Perfumes, oils, all the jewelry, clothes she wants. But hey, she's a kept woman. So there's no freedom here. There's no love here. This is her world. So let's think about this for a second. What do we know about her? She's orphaned. Mom and dad's dead. This is cheery. She's exiled. She, they're not in Jerusalem. They're in Susa. They're in Persia. So she's not in her home. She's living in a land surrounded by her enemy. These are the people that conquered them, the Jews. And her cousin Mordecai doesn't even want her to really spread that around much. Don't talk about that. She's taken captive out of her house. The only guy that she ever that has been family to her since her mom and dad died. Now she's got no one. It seems that nothing is or has been in her control her entire life. She's beautiful, but she has no power, and she's alone. So the plot thickens. Who said the Bible wasn't good? Man, this could be a movie, right? So the plot thickens. There's this guy, Haman. 
He's one of these advisor fellows to the King Xerxes, right? Got the king's ear. Haman is from a tribe and a people that go way back. Back to the time of Moses. Back to the time of, of uh, Joshua. Back to the time of Exodus, where the Jews come out of Egypt, right? And God tells them, to go, I got this promised land for you. And, and go there. And they start to go there, and he tells them, hey, wipe out all these other guys. All these other people groups, take them out. Kill them. Well, they do some, and others they don't. Well, the ones they don't kill, the ones they don't take out, these are some uh, Haman's people. And there's a blood feud. And it's lasted for centuries. He hates Jews. Detest them. What you did to my people, you, you hurt a bunch of them. What they would do is they'd go to war, but they wouldn't kill everybody, leave some of them. Well, what's that leave? Hatred. Revenge. This is the law of the land. You kill me, I kill you back. Matter of fact, I'll try to kill you more. And that's what Haman, Haman has been raised with this. These stories were passed down generation to generation to generation of these things that happened. And Haman has heard them all his life. And so when the Jews have been conquered, what's, what would he love more than anything else? Wipe these people out. And he's got the king's ear. Xerxes' ear. The guy that commands 1,700,000 soldiers' ear. That is the ruler of basically the known world. This is the guy he's talking to. And he strikes a deal with him. He makes a deal with the king to wipe these people out. King, why don't you write a law that says all the Jews got to die? King says, okay. We'll do it. And remember, what the king says happens. So here we are, chapter 4. And we're going we're gonna to read through chapter 4. So when Mordecai learned about all that had been done, he tore his clothes, put on burlap and ashes, and went out into the city, crying with a loud and bitter wail. He went as far as the gate of the palace, for no one was allowed to enter the palace gate while wearing clothes of mourning. And as the news of the king's decree reached all the provinces, there was great mourning among the Jews. They fasted, wept, and wailed, and many people lay in burlap and ashes. When Queen Esther's maids and the eunuchs came and told her about Mordecai, she was deeply distressed. Oh, wait a second. Why doesn't she know about this? Oh, that's right. She's isolated. She's alone. She's kept woman. She doesn't get to know. The only way she gets to know news is from the servants that get to go in and out. She doesn't get to go in and out. And she hears about her cousin, the guy who's raised her. And he's, he's out there mourning. What's going on? What's happening? So, verse 5, then she sent for Hatakat, one of the king's eunuchs who had been appointed to her as an attendant, and she ordered him to go to Malachi and find out what was troubling him and why he was in mourning. So Hatakat went out to Mordecai in the square in the front of the palace gate, and Mordecai told him the whole story, including the exact amount of money Haman had promised to pay into the royal treasury for the destruction of the Jews. Mordecai gave Hatakak a copy of the decree issued in Susa that called for the death of all the Jews. He asked Hatakak to show it to Esther and explain the situation to her. He also asked Hatakak to direct her to go to the king to beg for mercy and plead for her people. So Hatakak returned to Esther with Mordecai's message. Then Esther told Hatakak to go back and relay this message to Mordecai. 
All the king's officials and even the people in the provinces know that anyone who appears before the king in his inner court without being invited is doomed to die unless the king holds out his gold scepter. And the king has not called me for, to come to him for 30 days. So Hataka gave Esther's message to Mordecai. Mordecai sent back his reply to Esther. Don't think for a moment that because you're in the palace, you will escape with all the other Jews when all the other Jews are killed. If you keep quiet at this time, at a time like this, deliverance and relief for the Jews will arise from some other place. But you and your relatives will die. Who knows if perhaps you were made queen just for such a time as this. Verse 15. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go and gather together all the Jews of Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will do the same. And then, though it is against the law, I will go in to see the king. If I must die, I must die. So Mordecai went away and did everything as Esther had ordered him. Esther's had no control over her life up until now. She hadn't made any decisions. They've all been made for her. And now what is she faced with? Life or death. Seriously. And, oh, by the way, if it wasn't just your life, it's everybody's life that you know. Great. No pressure. She doesn't want to do it, does she? I mean, she says to Mordecai, that, hey, listen, everybody knows if, you go, if I go see the king and he does not, has not called for me, they, they just kill you right then. They don't mess around. They just kill you. Unless for some reason the king says, okay, and he lowers his scepter. There's no negotiation. There's no yeah, buts. Wait a minute, I gotta... No. You're dead. You don't mess with King Xerxes. This is the world she lives in. And now she has to make this decision. And how does she decide? How does she decide between... Now, let's face it. This is all she's ever known. So maybe it's not super awful. It is comfortable. She's got a nice palace, right? She's got stuff to wear. And it, and it almost feels like she's got a little control, maybe, for the first time in her life, because there are eunuchs that are tending to her. If she needs something, they'll, they help her out, right? This has never happened to her before. And at this point, the king has said, I choose you for queen. There's some significance that goes along with that, isn't there? And she's weighing all this in her head. In this story, when, when Mordecai is saying, you got to go, you got to go before the king. And she's like, wait a minute, you know, if I do that, that's, that's messed up. And, you know, as, as crazy as my spot is where I'm at, I don't know. I don't know. I can, I can just imagine how it's got to be wearing on her. But then Mordecai, and this is, this is the, like the, the jewel of the book of Esther. He writes back to her and he says, you know what? If you don't do this, there's going to be another situation that's going to arise. Somehow the Jews are going to be saved. What is he saying? You know, Esther is the only book in the Bible that doesn't mention God's name doesn't say God. But that's who he's talking about, isn't it? It's, it's a sign of Mordecai's faith right there. He believes that God will make a way. If it's not Esther, it'll be another way. But God's faithful. And he doesn't have to say God to Esther. She knows it. She's been raised Jewish. She understands God. She knows she's one of the chosen people. She knows she's supposed to keep it a secret. She knows all about this. She knows who God is. And Mordecai reminds her who she is. It's great. 
Mordecai reminds her that she's a Jew and what her identity is and who she is really. And at that point, everything changes. Everything changes for Esther. For Queen Esther, she, she understands this and she knows at this point it's not Xerxes who's going to hold her life in his hands. It's God. Xerxes might give the order for her to be killed, but this is God's doing. God is stronger than even this king. And that is amazing, that turn of events, that twist in her thoughts. She was thinking this one way. She was following the rules. She's always been under control. And then she remembers who she is. And this light comes on. And she says, if I got to die, I got to die. And she understands that her life is in God's hands. Wow. And what does she ask? She asks Mordecai, fast, pray for me. Petition God. Talk to him and I'll do the same. I'm going to look to my creator. I'm going to look to the one, the only one that I stand a chance in the world of coming out of this. It's only going to be because of him. Because there's probably no other chance of success. I can't imagine doing this on my own. I don't have the strength. She doesn't have the influence. She doesn't have anything going for her. So Esther recognizes who she is. Do we know this? Do we know who we are? And do we believe this? And who rules our life? Are we like Esther in a way, kind of cruising off? Okay, this is, this is kind of a rotten spot I'm in, but you know what? It's been worse. I got through worse. It's okay. You know what? It's all right. I'm a Christian. I believe in Jesus. He's good. But is it who we are? Do we realize who Jesus is in our lives? Do we realize who God is in our lives and how the decisions in our lives are made? Are we just like, hey, you know, I got this, Lord. I got this. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm feeling kind of rough and down, but I got this. And we'll go and go and go until what? We, we can't go anymore. So, who rules our lives? What was it like when you were growing up? Because some of this is cultural. When you're growing up, what does everybody ask you? Do you got a dream? What do you want to be? What do you want to be when you grow up? Right? Maybe you said, I want to be a fireman. I want to be a nurse. Doctor. Lawyer. I want to be a pastor. Yeah. How's that worked out? Are you in control of your life? Or are we more like Esther than we want to admit? That you know what? We had a lot of dreams and we had a lot of aspirations and we had a lot of things that we thought we were going to do, but somehow, man, it just never quite got there. And somehow, all the control I thought I had in my life or I dreamed I was going to have, it isn't there. And I still want to maintain things like I think I have control in my life. I still want to think I have some comfort in my life. I still want to think that I'm significant somehow in my life. Apart from God. You know what? I can do this. I can do it on my own. And it's okay. God, don't worry about that. I'll, I'll be a firefighter. I'll be the best firefighter, the best doctor, the best nurse. And then it lets you down. Because one day you screw up. And something bad happens. And you find out you're not the best. You weren't in control, and it's not very comfortable. What happens then? Your identity is all tied up in the wrong place. And we're like Esther. We need a Mordecai to come and say, hey, remember who you were? 
Remember who you are? We're almost like living in exile ourselves. Because in the beginning, back in Genesis, what? God makes people in whose image? His. Well, wait a minute. I'm made in his image? That's pretty cool. That sounds like a pretty significant, important spot to be. But then it gets all jacked up with sin, rebellion. We want to stick everything else in a place of knowing who we are. Rather than knowing we're made in the image of God, we want to say, no, I'm a doctor. I'm made in the image of a doctor, a pastor, a nurse. That's who I am. That's not who you are. You never were. You've always been made in the image of God, and you can't get away from it. And we've never had any control in our life. We just think we have. So how do you, how do you solve this? You give up. Quit. Stop believing the lie, the illusion. You're never going to be good enough. You're never going to be able to work hard enough. You won't ever be that. You'll never find that significance in whatever you're doing. It's not going to happen for you. You'll run and run and run. And you'll never get there. The only way that you're going to find your significance is to give up and go back to the beginning. Remember who you were. Who you made to be. And who rules your life? Do you want to continue ruling it? Do you want to keep substituting the truth? Or do you want Jesus Christ to rule your life? To help you make every decision. To be there like God was in the beginning with Adam, walking with him in the cool of the day, talking about things that are going on. Do you want that life? Or do you just want to keep figuring this out on your own? Because that's a real question. This is one that Esther had to figure out. And she was willing to face death because she finally figured out who she was and put her trust in the only one that's trustworthy and the only thing that's trustworthy, the almighty God, creator of the earth, who made her in his image. So, Second Chronicles, chapter 7, verse 14. What kind of God is this? That is, we're made in his image? What does he say? He says in Second Chronicles, Then if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and forgive their sins and restore their land. Hallelujah! Thank goodness! You don't get that deal everywhere. Nobody gives you that deal. The President of the United States, the leaders of the world, King Xerxes, nobody gives you that deal. That everything is washed away, you're forgiven, and he heals you at the same time. Amen. Exactly. Amen. But this is what it means to have Jesus as Lord and Savior in your life. Habakkuk, another one of the Old Testament prophets. You probably read Habakkuk every day. Um, chapter 2, verses 2 to 4. Habakkuk did talk to God, and God answered him here. He says, Habakkuk, write my answer plainly on tablets so that a runner can carry the correct message to others. This vision is for a future time. It describes the end, and it will be fulfilled. If it seems slow in coming, wait patiently, for it will surely take place. It will not be delayed. Verse 4, look at the proud. They trust in themselves, and their lives are crooked. But the righteous will live by their faithfulness to God. Where am I? It's right there. I trust in myself, my own pride. I can do it. I, I got my big boy pants on. Can't do it. We can't do it. We can't do it ourselves. 
We can't live this life the way it's meant to be lived all on our own. We need help. And we don't need help just some of the time. We need help all of the time. This isn't just a, oh, I'm in trouble. No, this is, hey, Lord, what are we going to do today? Lord, how can I glorify you today? Lord, how, how can you use me today to do something? I want to be used by you. I long for this. I want to be in your presence. I don't ever want to leave you. I only want to be around you. I don't care if there's anybody else around. Please don't you leave. Be my Lord. But no, we're, we're happy with, with Jesus if he's going to be our Savior. We're not so happy if he, to be our Lord. But that's what we need. We need him to be our Lord. So who are you? If you find your identity in anyone or anything other than God, you're looking in the wrong place. And your heart's in the wrong place. We're made to be like God, bearing his image. And when you finally get that, you can start living the life God has for you. But until then, you're just going to fight. Struggle, fight, fight, fight. And he'll let you. Wear yourself out. He's going to win. Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. He says, imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, because you are his dear children. Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice, a pleasing aroma to God. I want to do that. I want to love people. As, as a church, as a Christian, I want to love people. And guess what? I'm rotten at that. I stink at that. If it wasn't for God in my life, I, don't, I couldn't love anybody. I'd be all concerned about me. I wouldn't be care about anybody else. What's going on? But because he is in my life, and he's changing my heart, and this is a process, my brother, my sister, my family, why don't I treat you like that? I don't want to just come and sit with you on Saturday night and just, just be. I want to, you're my family. What's going on with you? I want to know you. I want to know what's going on, and I want you to know me, and I want us to know each other. We're connected by Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit of God living in each one of us. That's ominous. That's incredible. Why don't we live like that? We're not living that truth. That's the truth. Instead, we're scared. Oh, if they knew the truth about me, if they knew all about me, they wouldn't like me. No. That's not true. We love our family. Warts and all, we're God's children. And he sacrificed for us. He loved us first. I don't love first and then he loves me. No, it's all him. If he hadn't loved me first, I couldn't love you. Heck, matter of fact, I couldn't love me. We go to the movies every once in a while, and um, we went to see that uh, Guardians of the Galaxy. Have you guys seen this? You know about this? Okay. It's about this ragtag, messed up band of people that get together and save the world. Yeah, it's kind of cool. So there's one character in this, this group of anti-superheroes, if you will, because they're all kind of messed up. They're all jacked up. They're all got their issues. And she has been living with the arch enemy, the guy, the evil guy in this movie, right? She's been under his control. She's an assassin. She's been killing people for him. And she hates it. But this is her life. This is what she's known. So this is normal for her. And she says this in the movie, as they're coming together to finally go out and to conquer this guy, right? 
to fight this guy. She says, I've lived most of my life surrounded by enemies. I would be honored to die with my friends. Did you catch that? I lived most of my life with my enemies. Esther has lived most of her life with her enemies. But what she say? Pray for me, my friends, my family. Pray for me and I will go lay my life on the line. I will be honored to lay my life out for my friends. Does this also sound familiar of another man? Jesus Christ who said what? I lay down my life. He you know, says no greater love has anybody that they laid down their life for their brother, for their friend. And this is what he does. I want to join in that. If I got to die, I want to die with my friends. I want to die with the church. I want to die with you folks. I want to die trying. I want to die swinging. Teaching people about Jesus, maybe helping them to come to understand him more, to hear about him, to know him, to live with him. So he's in their life, not just on Saturday night, but every day. Every minute of every day, they walk with them, they talk with them, they live with them. He is part of who they are, and he brings life like no other. Amen. That's my dream for myself. It's my dream for my brothers and my sisters. I want that. Because that's powerful, and that changes the world. So if we're imitating God... We're hearing his call to love. We're following his directions. And we're praying for his lordship in our lives. In the big things and the little things. In everything. And it takes trust. Esther has to trust. To say, if I die, I die. I will go. What's that like in our lives? What's it like to have that trust? Because it's one thing to talk about it. It's another thing to do it. I've asked Wendy to, to share a story with you about what trust has been like with her and God. And I think it's on. Is it on? No, it's the red one. It's the red one. Okay. Um, well, hey. <laughs> <laughs> um, Kelly and I got married in 2005, and in 2006, 14 months after, I was at my office one day, and my daughter called and said that um, his coworkers had called the house and he was being taken to the hospital in an ambulance because he had had a seizure at work. I was at my office with no vehicle because I had lent it to friends. So she came to my office to get me and we started the 45 minute trip to the hospital where he was being taken. Uh, and while I was waiting for her to come to the office, I'm calling every single person I know, every single person I know at church, every single person I know that's a friend, asking them to pray. We head to the hospital. We're on the road for about, oh, 10 or 15 minutes, and I get another phone call, and it is a coworker of his who is his friend. And he said, we told Brittany that it was a seizure because we didn't want her to worry. He had a heart attack. They had to do CPR, and they had to shock his heart. And he didn't know what happened. He knew he was in the ambulance, and he was, he was following the ambulance there. So I start recalling all of those people, telling them what actually happened. My daughter is sitting next to me. After about the sixth phone call, my 17-year-old says, Mom, please stop. I cannot hear you say that one more time. So I tell the last person, you, may, you know, call everybody, everybody that we know. And there were literally hundreds of people praying and all I could do while I was driving is pray with her and say, God, he's your man. And I can't do anything here except trust you with him. He's yours, and you help me get there. 
So then we get lost, because I've never been to this hospital before. And the doctor told me he was actually dead before he hit the floor. By all rights, they should not have been able to shock his heart and start it again, but they did. As you can see, <laughs> he's here. Um, there isn't even any heart damage, which is unheard of. Um, but then like two months later, I'm passing a church sign that says, with God, all things are possible. Possible does not mean easy. I'm thinking, yeah, of course. And then through the next couple of weeks, that thought just keeps coming back and coming back randomly. I'm at work and I'm, you know, and it comes back and then I'm driving down the road and it comes back and I was like, oh, hey, you're trying to talk to me, aren't you? What are you trying to tell me? And then I watch Kelly talking with someone at church and it hits me, he is supposed to be preaching. He's not supposed to be selling parts. He is supposed to be preaching. A couple of weeks later, he says, I got to tell you something. I think I'm supposed to go back to school to be a preacher. Yeah, I know. God told me that already. But now how to make it happen. So me, I'm a huge planner. I start getting out the numbers, and I've got the plan. This is where we're going to go. This is what we're going to do. He says, no. Uh-uh. He sent, God sent us from Michigan to Tennessee. We tour the campus because if I work full time and I can carry insurance on both of us, it can happen because he can do this and da da da, da. I've got the whole plan. It's good to go. And then we do the tour of campus and I see the training facility for counselors and my heart just about jumps out of my chest. It's like, but this isn't for me. This isn't about me. This is him. And it can't happen. It can't work because I know the numbers. I'm an accountant. I get the numbers. It doesn't work. And God kept going, yeah, it does. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it does. And I said to him, I said, I'm going to send in an application and go for this. And unless God really closes doors, I'm just going to keep moving forward. And after seven years of a budget that always worked and never added up, and um, almost losing our house, but managing somehow in the last hour and a half before they foreclosed on it to save it, I've gotten to the point where I don't question and wrestle as long. Because I still question, and I still wrestle, and I still, I still make my plans. And then I remember that he doesn't need me to tell him how it's going to work best. If I follow what he's doing, even when it's impossible, it somehow still works out. And it's, a, it's hard to learn that kind of trust. But it's been repeated over and over and over and over again that now I, I, I think I'm starting to get it finally. But there's always that next time where I go, that's right, I forgot. And that's why I am so thankful that God is so faithful. Because no matter how many times I forget, he never forgets. I'll leave you with this verse, Colossians 3, verse 1 and 2. Since you've been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven, where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. As a, we go out from here, we need to have a paradigm shift, a transformation of difference of thought and heart as a church, as God's people, as his children, that we know that Christ is on that throne in our life. We know that he's in the, on the throne of all of our lives. We know that he, everything he does is for our good. And we know that although it looks impossible, and it looks messed up, and it's all jacked up, and it doesn't seem like there's any way it's going to work out, it does. 
because he's in control, we're not. And as God's children, we're empowered by his spirit, and we are in the very presence of the king right now. He's here. He's here. He's each one of you. Whenever two or more are gathered, I am there. We can trust our king. Why? Because he died for us. And we can love like our king. Why? Because he lives in us. Moses? Um, Robert, you don't mind? Andrew, can I put you to work too? Andrew, would you help Robert hand out communion? So the king has power, right? That was a good message. You know, I don't know what's more powerful, that message or your sneakers, but that was a good message, bro. And I'm certainly glad you're not dead. I like you better alive. Um, I don't know if you guys realize how fortunate we are to have this, this uh, man right here at our church. I know. I, I'm truly blessed to have you here. Um, the king does have power. Um, Xerxes, he could have killed someone on the spot, you know? He can get things done. When you need something done, you go to the king, right? He can get all things done. I think about the godfather, right? You go to the godfather because you need something done. You go to the king if you need something done, but not everybody could go into the presence of the king and ask for his favor, right? You couldn't just walk in. We just heard the story. You can't walk in without permission. You walk in and he's not happy about it. You're dead. But there's one king, like he said, that's, that's even stronger than King Xerxes. Xerxes was the earthly king of, a, of the known world. There's one king that's king of the entire universe. And, and here's the beautiful thing, and I picked up on this in your story, is that when, the, when someone needed some help from the king, you didn't need to like um, be nervous about going in and, and asking. She called all of her buddies, all the coworkers that were Christians, and said, go before the king and ask, and they were able to. So we're supposed to take communion, right? It's the time of the week where we take communion. We remember Jesus. So here's what I want to remind you of, the special privilege of the Christian to go before the king. It's in Hebrews chapter 10. It starts in verse 19. It just says this, and so dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. By his death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. And since we have a great high priest who rules over God's house, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. For our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean, and our bodies have been washed with pure water. So you have permission because of Jesus to go right before, not Xerxes, not Caesar, not our president, but the king, the real king of kings because of what Jesus did. The message is that Kelly said, the message is that Esther was willing to die for her friends. And that's awesome, right? You know what's even more awesome? It's Jesus Christ. He goes to the cross. He's not there to die for his friends. He's there to die for his enemies. That's what sets him apart above all other people. The Bible says that we were his enemies because of our sin. But Jesus goes to the cross anyway, even though you were his enemy, in, in glad rebellion against God. But he dies for you anyway. And that's what this bread represents that his body that goes to the cross for you and for me. Let's take that in remembrance of him. And again, we can enter into heaven's most holy place. Think of the throne room of Xerxes. Now think of the throne room of God Almighty. And because of the blood, this drink right here, because of the blood of Jesus, you get to enter into that holy of holies, the ultimate throne room of all the universe. And let's take this drink in remembrance of Jesus.
Lord, I, I just want to thank you for uh, letting us gather here tonight. Of course, we'd be negligent if we didn't ask for your incredible, amazing blessing upon Adam and Tara DiGiacomo as they start their life together now, the two becoming one. What God has brought together, let no man separate. Let their life be blessed. Let their time together be treasured. Help them to worship you well. And wherever they send Adam in the service, who knows where that'll be. Lord, use that couple. Use them to shine the light of Jesus to whoever they come across. Lord, I thank you for our message today. Thank you for letting us come into your presence because of what Jesus has done. Lord, thank you for the privilege of being able to, be, to go before you, speak to you openly with a sincere heart, just talk to you like a son or a daughter with our dad. We thank you. And Lord, help us to respond well to you now. For all that you've done on the cross, help us to respond well now as we sing songs to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, you guys can stand if you want to. You don't have to. I just kind of want you to soak in the presence of the King. You know, just uh, get with Jesus. Stay with Jesus. You give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. In grace. Is your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise, it's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise to only you. You give life. You give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. And pray
Yes, great are you, Lord. So great are you, Lord. Great are you, Lord. Just the voices, it's your breath. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise, pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise to only you. Fill 